This week on Quality Digest Live, we consider ISO 9001-2015's language on the context of the organization. Plus, an honest discussion about truth. <laughs> that more when we come back. And welcome back to Quality Digest Live for February 3rd, 2017. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief, Dirk Ducharme. Uh, so this week we're going to continue uh, what's in and out for mm -hmm. technology, which we kind of started a couple weeks ago. And, you know, every, beginning of every year, we start. Everybody sure. starts sending us our prognostications <laughs> for you know, uh, you know, what technology is going to be in, what's going to be out. Um, and this, uh, this week, we're going to hear from NIST in the article, Ideas Whose Time Has Come and Gone. Um, out. First thing, out. The mm -hmm. single atomic clock. No. Yes, it is. I'm sorry. Single atomic clock is out. What? Instead, we're going to have dual atomic clocks because cool. everybody knows one, two atomic clocks are better than one atomic clock. One is just never enough. And uh, you know, why build one when you can build two for <laughs> exactly. twice the price? When there's a reason for it. <laughs> Physicists at NIST announced in November 2016 that they have set yet another world record for clock stability when they combined two experimental atomic clocks based on the e Eterbian atoms. Uh, according to NIST, the approach used by the scientists ultimately may lead to a reduced atomic clock size and complexity and a state-of-the-art performance, which means and this is, the, this is the important bit about it, we may soon be able to see extremely good portable atomic clocks. Nice. Um, yeah, that's the whole idea. Right now, the atomic clock, it, it's, it's really not portable. But mm. the, the stability and stuff they can get from having two and making it portable means they might be able to put it up on satellites or mm. in space station. Uh, it's going to be more portable. And it's stuff for, uh, important for things like geodesy, uh, GPS, that sort of thing. Sure, so that's right. kind of the motivation behind it. Also in the more is better column is DNA markers. The number of DNA markers in forensic DNA profile is going up. Currently, DNA profiles in the United States are created by looking at 13 specific regions of DNA called markers. On January 1st, 2017, the FBI started requiring that all DNA profiles entered into its combined DNA index system, or CODIS, be based on at least 20 markers. Wow. Another thing that's out, the international prototype kilogram. And what's in is the watt balance. Yep. Now, we've talked about talked this about several this one, times yeah. because this is actually a really, really big deal. The kilogram standard will no longer be this yeah. hunk of yeah. metal sitting in a bell jar somewhere in Paris, but instead will be based on a physical constant. And that's the, not the only standard they're doing this with, the only, not the only physical Right, but it's, uh, but it's about, the last one, it's yeah. about the last one left because yep. actually yeah. the kilogram one has so much effect on other things that once, this, once the kilogram, once the watt balance is in, in place and uh, the kilogram is based on physical measurement, mm -hmm. I mean a, a physic, uh, yes, a physical standard, standard. Uh, then uh, a lot of other uh, Avogadro's constant and a couple other Planck's constant all come into place as well. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorites, Ublek. Do you have a place with Ublek? No, but I saw it a little bit in this article. Well, so. <laughs> Ublek is a slurry of, um, of a, a, a starch and water, and it, it behaves like silly putty. You played with silly yeah, putty, yeah, right? Sure, sure. Well, if you, if you put your hand into it or squeeze it gently, mm -hmm. it's just squeezable, yeah. like, like yeah. you know, it's silly oozy, putty. right? Yeah, like yeah, silly yeah, putty. Yeah. But if you hit it really hard, it's solid. Yeah. And the question has always been, is it friction between particles or is it viscosity? Well, NIST concludes that it's actually both. Ublek is called a non-Newtonian substance and go back and forth, as we said, between liquid mm. and solid based on how you treat it. Uh, it goes from this gooey slurry, when in the case of Ublek, uh, Ublek to almost an almost solid substance, either by pounding it or squeezing it. By the way, if you've played with Silly Putty, you know that you can stretch Silly Putty, but if you pull it really hard, it snaps. Mm -hmm. Or you can mold it like clay, but if you throw it, make a ball out of it and throw it on the floor, it bounces like a Super Bowl. You right? can also read your comics. And you can, that's right, and you can put it on comics and <laughs> lift the comics right off the page. Okay. And what causes the change, friction of viscosity, has long been debated. And as it turns out, it's both. Mm -hmm. Finally, what's out? Crazy, yeah, like it shows on this crazy <laughs> password <laughs> requirements. That's out. What's in is free range passwords. Are those passwords that chickens use? Yes. Oh, actually, the nice thing about it, yeah, is you'll be able to use a word like 
chicken space scratch. Free range chicken. Free range, exactly. Free range chicken that wants to be password. a password. Well, because it turns out that you're not the only one worn out by all the crazy password right. requirements. In May 2016, NIST offered the public a preview of the draft digital authentication guideline document, which includes new guidance on password policies to be used by the U.S. government, and we would assume later the public. Mm -hmm. Included in the draft recommendations, and this is a good one, allowing for longer passwords, well, who cares, removing special character requirements, requirements which drive me up the wall, allowing spaces in most other characters and passwords. So if your password wanted to be chicken scratch, Space scratch, it could be that. Could be that. You can have right. a space. Or it could be your name, right? Your name, yeah. right? All right. Don't know, doing how, away how, don't with, know how secure that would be, but okay. And also <laughs> doing away with the, the annoying password hints. Right. I don't know what my first grade teacher's name is. You ever seen that? They give you a list of. Miss, Miss Fiato? Oh, no. What's the matter with I you? don't even remember the first grade. <laughs> Man. That's because right. it was in 1912. <laughs> well, exactly. That's what I'm saying. I think it was like a. I don't know. Anyway. <clears throat> All this is going to improve usability, and not just usability, but security as well. By the way, NIST also announced the release um, of three new, uh, uh, three or four new elements mm -hmm. in the periodic table of elements. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. NIST has been busy. NIST they they been always busy. are. All right. right. Thanks, Derek. All right. Well, right. staying with the theme of technological ideas, here's a story about manufacturing innovations whose time has definitely come and will hopefully stick around for a while too. Deloitte study finds that Manufacturing USA spurs R&D innovation. You can see it right there. Uh, it's the name of this piece, which we published in Wednesday's issue of Quality Digest. Well, the report looks closely at the Manufacturing USA initiative, which was authorized by the Revitalized American Manufacturing and Innovation Act of 2014. Manufacturing USA supports a network of advanced manufacturing institutes on the cutting edge of research and development, as we know. These institutes focus on applications in the fields of robotics, composites, photonics, and clean energy, among other things. Uh, there's now 14 such institutes across the United States. According to the study's authors, these institutes are quickly reaching tipping points where companies, colleges, and universities, and governmental agencies see partnering with these institutes as, as critical to their own success. In fact, many of these organizations are pursuing membership without even being asked or prompted. They're coming in on their own because they see the value of working with these institutes. Now, the reasons why the program has been so successful, they're really not a surprise. There is a keen need <clears throat> within the manufacturing sector for innovation in developing new products and markets, for help in addressing the shortage of technologically trained workers, and uh, for the development of a sustainable, truly national manufacturing research infrastructure. Those are all really important high goals. The first eight of these institutes, which were established by the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy starting in 2012, were federally funded to the tune of 600 million bucks. So uh -oh. definitely good investment with another 1.3 billion raised through private investment. So about a, about a two to one ratio there in terms of private to, to right. public funding. Uh, a major priority is that these institutes become self-sustaining. So the emphasis is kind of less on theoretical research and more on the practical applications of this stuff. Manufacturing USA, of course, has a responsibility to ensure that these taxpayer investments are, are spent, spent wisely and it makes a lot of sense. Um, I think it bears repeating that with uh, a federal spending belt tightening, almost certainly on the horizon here, we've heard about this, uh, the pressure to ensure that these monies are properly invested will only increase, I think, in coming years. Uh, but given proper oversight, uh, it's tough to see how this is a program that won't kind of cut the mustard and continue to, to, to move forward going forward because there's just too much here to like. I mean, you think about all the things that I mentioned, you know, training people to do work, you know, keeping American uh, manufacturing on the cutting edge, having an infrastructure where people can rely on each other. I mean, these are really good things for industry and it's, if anything's gonna be cut, this is one that you think there'd be a lot of pushback to cutting. Well, yeah, but I mean, we've already talked that there's rumors that the MEP yeah. budget or the MEP may be done away with completing right, the Manufacturing right. Extension Partnership, which is related, similar kind of... Also from NIST. Also from NIST. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see all of these kind of on the chopping block. I don't know, but I mean, it's just, like I say, to, to, to wave our flag a little bit and cheerlead a little bit, this is one that, that you can see. Right. Itself. Manufacturing USA is working. That was definitely the takeaway of the Deloitte study, so we, yep. we feel pretty strongly that this yeah, is a good and, and we are keeping our eyes on what's yes. going to be happening with, uh, with the budget for all these things going forward. That's so. right, that's right. Uh, one of the newest parts of ISO 9001 2015 and related management standards, quality management standards, are the concepts of context and interested parties. 
what the heck are those, right? What, what does context mean when it comes to your company and, and compliance with a QMS standards? And, who just who are interested parties. And I'll tell you, we've done a lot of ISO 9001 2015 webinars over the past few years, and I can tell you that there is for sure, especially recently with the new standard, mm -hmm. confusion on just what or who constitutes an interested party. So with us today to shed a little light on context and interested parties is Pam Bethune, author of the article ISO 9001 2015, Establishing the Context of the Organization. Pam is the Automotive Regional Competency Manager for DECRA certification. Uh, hi Pam, thanks for joining us. Hi Mike and Dirk, how you doing? Hey, pretty good. Well, let's just jump right in here. Um, are people really having a hard time understanding the context of the organization or, or interested parties? I mean, is that really an issue of kind of wrapping their heads around that? And if so, why do you think that is? Well, yeah, our, our auditors have had several inquiries on this. It's a new concept. It hasn't been done before. So unlike the old standard, uh, we don't have an extensive tribal knowledge about this, nor is there an extensive uh, set of sanctioned interpretations or FAQs to help spell it out, to help us understand the clause, the expectations of how to deal with it. So we've had many questions on how to deal with it, how to understand it, uh, how to interpret it, how to implement it, uh, how to document it, and in particular, how will this be audited, both internally and externally? So people are, are confused and uncertain about what's going on. So they're looking for a little help. Well, I know, Pam, we have a webinar on this uh, that's coming up next week with you uh, on Thursday, and I know we're going to go into it in a lot more detail then, but uh, in a nutshell, maybe just give us the high level, what does context of the organization actually mean? It means the environment that the business operates in, uh, the technology, the culture, the laws and regulations, societal expectations, community, all of that stuff. I mean, if you think about it, a company that creates software in a totally virtual environment, and, and there are those, companies that provide engineering services versus companies that have a, a heavy physical presence, such as a stamping company or a plating company, all of those have very different environments that, that they operate in. The technology is different between those. The culture, uh, if you have a facility that's in India or in Africa, or in Europe, or America, or Asia. There's going to be a very different culture and cultural expectations, laws and regulations. Heck, if you cross a county line in the United States, you're going to get different regulations. Uh, societal expectations. Uh, if, if you're a very small co company, there may be very few societal expectations. If you're very, very large, there may be some. If you employ 6,000 people in a 20,000 person town, there are some very different expectations that your local society has. Community. Uh, if you're a plating company, people may be concerned about the trucks rumbling through their neighborhoods, or noise, or smells, or concerns about the environment, about a spill. Uh, so all of those come into play in what the context is. All of that constitutes the context. And they're very different for every, every company out there. Well, and how important, how important is understanding this content, uh, concept, and, and how does it impact, uh, I don't know, and maybe how does it tie into, let's say, risk assessment, if, if, if any? I mean, that's a big topic in itself, risk assessment, but does context yeah. of the organiz organization tie into that? Absolutely. If you look at it, context is the very first part of the standard after the introduction. It is the very first clause. Therefore, logically, you should be looking at that and saying, why is this first? Why is it the first thing they talk about? And it's because it frames all the subsequent clauses. It helps create the boundaries of your quality management system, uh, the scope, in other words. Working on the context allows the business to fully understand the groups that it impacts and that impact it. Uh, in other words, the interested parties. So the context helps you create the list, if you will, of interested parties. Interested parties in turn drive the risk assessment. So let's look at a company that's say in the automotive space. Well, context has to identify the National Highway Transportation Safety Agency as an interested party. It's part of the regulatory environment. 
So it's NITS is an interested party for that company. So that creates a potential risk. How is that risk then analyzed since it's been identified? Once it's been analyzed, how do you deal with it appropriately? In the case of the services company, for example, personnel are a huge part of the context. I mean, they have to find them, hire them, train them, retain them. So employees are a very interested, interested party, and there are risks associated with that that have to be identified, analyzed, dealt with. So it drives directly into the risk assessment and as well as the scope. That's why it's the first clause in the standard, because it sets the frame, sets the boundaries for everything else that follows. Well, thanks, Pam. I mean, that's that's probably one of the clearest explanations I've, yeah, I so. I've heard of it in a really long time. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to learn more of, about this in the webinar coming up ne next week. Uh, uh, Pam, thanks thanks for joining us this morning. Really appreciate it. If you want to learn more about context and interested parties, join us for the webinar ISO revisions, context of the organization, uh, this coming Thursday, February 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. The webinar will be presented by Pam Bethune, just as we've seen here. Uh, keep an eye on your email or, or your inbox for details about that. And also you can see, uh, there's a link actually underneath the player page there as well. So Pam, thanks for joining us. You're very welcome. Okay. See you on Tuesday. Thanks, Pam. Actually, it's Thursday. Oh, Thursday. 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 See you on Thursday. Yes. <laughs> right, right. Sorry about that. Thanks, Pam. Bye-bye. <laughs> See you then. All right. Bye-bye. Right. And yeah, for all of you out there, yes, definitely sign up for that one. A lot of you have already registered for it. Um, you know, we, we, we haven't really done a lot of webinars on context. No. Uh, as Insurance you party comes up. A risk, risk has been kind of the, the big topic. Yeah. Now, but, but I mean, as you can yeah. see, it all underlays it all, one yeah, another. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and I mean, Pam, uh, I think you can tell just from that, that short uh, seven minutes we spent. This is going to be informative. Yes, webinar. be very informative. Yeah. She's got a very, a very good style for dealing with that, uh, this topic. So yep. make sure you register for that one for next week. Okay. Truth, truth. Say truth. it, brother. Truth, 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 truth. By David Twin is the deceptively simple title of an article that we ran in Wednesday's issue of Quality Digest, as you can see right there. Um, David is, is really one of my favorite authors. I say that for a lot of our authors that yeah. I cover on the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It seems yeah. like I, I select a lot of the same people to cover stuff because it's like some people you just read their article and you find yourself like, yeah, Nodding, he yeah, gets yeah, it, yeah, you know? Yeah. I mean, I want to talk about that a little bit more. And I said deceptively simple because, I mean, you'd think that nothing, right, nothing, what's more black and white than truth, right? right. I mean, it's like, that's pretty simple, but <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, it's something either true or it's not is the bottom right, right, line. Right, but is right. that true, really? Yeah. Is something either true or not? I mean, yeah. there's a time when I would have said yes, you know, something either true or it's not. But the truth behind truth has become, I think, increasingly difficult to ascertain in this post-truth world of ours. It's been a <laughs> big term that's been bandied around a lot. Um, and I, I mean, let's be honest, there's a, a definitely a, a political approach that I could take to addressing the story. And I actually started with that. Okay. But we've been doing a lot of politics in the show. And yeah. I, you know, I was like, you know, maybe I should not take it in that direction. I mean, it's a valid direction, but maybe it's not the one that resonates best that I should talk about. So I, I, I really think that even though the subtext in this, I think is political to a certain extent, I think I want to focus more on the application and importance of, of, of the act of truth seeking with, within a business context, sure. the context of the organization, right? Yep. Um, specifically our business um, uh, of quality and quality assurance. For, for certain, the first duty of anyone having anything to do with quality is to be able to tell um, what is truly happening in your process. And only in that way can you begin to improve. I mean, you start with the truth, sure. right? I mean, if something's going on, you start with the truth and you go from there. But What are the facts? Exactly, that's, yeah. that's what you gotta start with. But um, I think you understand that, but then you, know, you, you think a little bit about the, the mechanics of discovering truth uh, when confronted with a problematic situation and, and, and you start to see how this really lays out. I mean, let's say a process in this case as an example, that, that's causing a, a much higher than expected defect rate. I mean, it's a typical thing, obviously, that any of us, any of you out there would, would look at. Um, any investigator in that circumstance is first gonna gather as much firsthand information as possible. He or she will look closely observe the process as it's happening, or perhaps he or she will actually work the process to experience the routines, the behaviors that comprise the specific part of that particular piece of the value stream. I mean, lean terms, we know that's considered going right. to the Gemba, or actually being in the Gemba, right, doing the right. work is the first thing. But first-hand experience is quickly gonna prove a little bit limited, especially if the broken process involves various workstations, different shifts, other facilities across the city or across the world. At some point, the investigator needs to access not only his or her own truth, but the truth about the process as it's perceived by others. So 
you start to see right, right, how things right, are going right, to start getting right. a little tricky here because even the best intentioned people are, are generally um, pretty poor witnesses. I mean, we've seen this, we've, we've read about this many times in, right. in the legal setting where even eyewitnesses are not good witnesses as right. to what really happened. You're like, you were there, you saw the crime committed, but they don't remember it that same, the way you really want them to. Right. Um, so even, even those people, like I say, they, they misremember stuff or they, they document poorly uh, or they mischaracterize what may have occurred. And again, that's well-intentioned people, right, right? right? People that are intentionally trying to help you and yeah. have, have the best of intentions in mind. I mean, bad actors can do all that. They can mischaracterize, they can forget, and they also can willfully make false statements, maybe to protect themselves, protect others or whatever. So, right. you know, you might say you can maybe circumvent a lot of that with, with data. I mean, many people out there say, listen and say, well, sure, but you can always rely on the data. And, and you, all you do, I mean, many do, but data really also has its limitations. Uh, even when you can factor in variations for, like I say, shifts in personnel, raw materials, et cetera, simple data can't always show you the details of the process as it actually occurs, or maybe doesn't occur, as the case may be. Um, and in that case, you find yourself going right back to, experiential evidence, uh, either as gathered by yourself or as others. I mean, so the data shows you a piece of what happens, right? But right. you can't, the data doesn't tell you and doesn't show you what people are doing as the data of, comes out of that process. So it, it's- So you can interpret that data based on your own bias. It's, so it's it, flat. If you're seeing so part exactly. of it. Exactly, yeah, it's yeah, so yeah. flat, you don't get, you don't get a three-dimensional view of it. So that's kind of yeah. limited too. Um, and there's other issues here for the dedicated truth seeker, even more than complex, uh, even more complex than determining what actually happened. I mean, after evidence is gathered, one must begin to piece it together and interpret what it all means. And in this, like Dirk just mentioned, you run into that trap, the insidious trap of bias. I mean, like truth, bias is a, is a it's pretty simple. It's a pretty simple concept. I mean, having a bias means that you, you have a preconceived notion, right? I mean, well, well, sure, but what do you do when you're not aware of your own bias? I mean, how do you perceive the difference between what you're maybe conditioned to believe versus what your, your experience has revealed to you over the course of a long and, and probably a really successful career. I mean, it's not always easy to tell those two things, experience versus bias. I mean, extending that previous example with the, the little fact-finding tour of the problem with the process, uh, think about maybe a top executive at the company going through that defect-causing process problem analysis. Maybe that executive, maybe he or she came up through the ranks and saw similar problems occur and be solved in, in certain ways. So, it would stand to reason that the executive, if, if he or she was presented with the problem, would be predisposed to the, to the go-to solutions that he or she found sure. worked in the past. Makes sense. But is that falling back on bias or is it benefiting from experience? If the investigator of the problem brings the, uh, the situation, the attention of the executive, will that executive subconsciously reject all potential solutions in favor of the proven cures that worked in the past? And by the way, did those proven cures really cure the issue? Or did the problem just go away on its own or did it morph into something else? Is it still going on in a yeah. slightly different yeah, way? Is yeah. that what's causing the problem that you're investigating now? It's really hard to tease out all those strands of truth and what truth is. You see how this is deceptively simple. Um, now I'm taking this to a different place than, than Schwinn did, but I, I mean, I think it's valid to question uh, the nature of, of things like perception and bias and truth in, in this way. I mean. It's important for us to consider it not only as quality professionals, but I, I think, and I'm gonna go back to the politics of this a little bit, but it's fully functioning members of society. I mean, you know, use your critical thinking. I mean, we gotta do our best to not only discover what's true, to, but, be, but to be conscious of our own internal mental pathways you know, to that discovery. I mean, it's only when we are aware of how we came to a conclusion and why that we can really make decisions that make sense for us and for the world and for our companies. But you have to be aware of of the pathways that brought you to the decision and, and try to be conscious of your biases, of your experiences, of your perceptions, of what people are telling you that may have good or ill will towards you and towards your fact finding. Well, I, I think even if you aren't, and this has been talked about a lot, especially recently, um, even if you aren't aware of your own biases, right. if you make an effort to look at data or look at research or look at news items or whatever you want, depending on the context, if you're willing to look at sources of information other than the ones you normally go to and be open to actually reading them and you know thinking about them, that can help to combat any bias that you might, it may not completely you know do away with it, but if you expose yourself 
to other people's ideas, to other people's perceptions of a, of a problem or a situation, then you're, you're better off than always going to your go-to source right. for, you know, talking always to the same engineer. You know, going to the same newspaper all the time, whatever, listening to the same talk show, whatever. It's known as the echo chamber. I mean, that's, that's it's the, the echo chamber, right? So if you use, get so. out of that echo chamber, if you're willing to listen to some other engineer that yeah. you no don't normally talk to, somebody who normally has a contrary opinion, if you do that, you may gain some more insight. You may still disagree, but you're going to gain some more insight and maybe help to combat that bias and get a little bit closer to maybe what the real truth is. You know, you have to force yourself to do that. You do first. have to force it. Nobody mean, likes to do that. No, it is. It, it's interesting because there's been a lot of studies lately about this idea about reinforcing truth and, and why we as humans want to seek out things that prove what we think is true is true versus yeah. discarding what we don't. There's a lot of tribalism that goes into that too. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenging right. issue. Um, and actually, you know, to tell you the truth, that actually plays a little bit into, into my off script. Oh boy, here it comes. I didn't, I didn't do this intentionally actually. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. And it, I don't know, it might, it might not be that, that, that accurate. Yeah, to do give it to me. Thing. But okay, all right. All right. Well, Dirk, oh, are you ready? Sure. Okay, this one's not too hard. Okay. okay. Well, we talked earlier about the, the Deloitte piece. Right. Okay. Um, Which was what? The Deloitte, where they, where they they did the survey about the the manufacturing USA. Oh, that's right. Research and okay, okay, right. Got right. It. You did. You were. <laughs> well, listen now, Dirk, because you're going to have to be on the spot here in about okay. two minutes. Okay. Okay. So, um, you know, part of that was this idea that that 600 million dollars was federally funded, and 1.3 was fund 1.3 billion was funded by by private private um, industry. Right. Um, so that's an example, obviously, of federal funds being used to support manufacturing. Right. But I want to show you a website right now, and I want to get your opinion on it. And, and Chris, if you can throw that one up there. Uh, this is the U.S. Debt Clock. Oh, jeez. I don't know if you've seen this, but if you, if you look, and Chris can maybe zoom in on that in the upper left-hand corner, the U.S. national debt is approaching $20 trillion. And in the time that it's going to take us to do this story, it's going to probably add about $2 million. Yeah. So yeah, that's just been a thousand right there and there and there and there and, <laughs> and, there, and, there, there, okay. and there. Okay, so look at that debt. Yeah. It's twenty yeah. trillion dollars of debt. Okay, uh, on that debt clock. So it's huge. It's amazing. It's mind-boggling. Yeah. Re really. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it is, um, and it's shocking. And it's yeah. and anybody along the political spectrum would say that's shocking. Yeah, it's a big league debt. It's it's a big league debt. <laughs> so we know that the Baldridge was defunded a few years ago. Right. Uh, we've covered that extensively here in the show. Um, we have heard rumors, and I'm investigating right now to determine the, the veracity of that, that the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, as you mentioned, is, is likely to be defunded, along with maybe the NEA, uh, the NEH, right. um, Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Yeah. So putting those to the side, because right. those are like, well, you know, I mean, yeah. you can make an argument for the keeping them or getting rid of them, but yeah. things like the MEP, things like the Baldrige, things like Manufacturing USA, I think these are valid things me as a taxpayer I'm willing to pay for because I think it supports even what the current administration is saying that the country should do, which is support right. manufacturing. So right. what are the limits? We have a $20 trillion debt. What, what, where does the balance come there in your mind between what we need to fund to protect our economy and, and expand our economy versus what taxpayers, I mean, they call it corporate welfare. Right, right, the right, term right, corporate right, welfare right. has been thrown around a lot. I mean, is it corporate welfare? Well, it's a little bit different because I do, the way I look at it is are you going to, and I'm sure the way they were set up is the idea is, well, yes, there's funding that goes into it. And Baldridge, actually, the Baldridge Award even set it up this way, is, or has described it this way. Yes, there's funds going into it, the taxpayer's paying for it, but the benefit in, in terms of increased productivity, you know, more lean companies, you know, uh, uh, you know kickstarting a company that'll, you know, uh, maybe get out of the red and into the green, that this all pays back into the economy and into the welfare of the uh, of the country as a whole so that even though the taxpayers footing the bill up front the the reward far exceeds what the taxpayers putting in so i mean i and i the thing is is so that would be the question which i hope if 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 they're looking at defunding things like this that somebody's actually doing the balance sheet how much have we put into let's say the mep for instance but what has come out of the mep has it improved productivity directly related to mep operations i mean can you say that well, we've put this many billion dollars in but we've got you know five times that more out for instance if you can then i'm saying sure you fund it but what if you can't what if you can't what if what if it, what if these are soft benefits that you know, it has to do with things like morale, uh, or has to do with things like ideas that are generated that are very hard to, to pin down. I mean, these, these institutes that we talked about earlier in the show in the Deloitte study, the Manufacturing USA are supporting, are down the line at some point intending to create um, you know, products that, that 
are commercially viable. But it's hard to tease out how much of that was due to the six hundred million dollars in federal funding versus anything else. How do you yeah. how do you allocate <laughs> it? I mean, or do you just take it on faith? I mean, the, the I, question well, I'm asking: I, I, Do you take honestly, it on faith? I, I think, I, I think, I think, I think, if you're a Democrat, you take it on faith. If you're a Republican, you say, "I want to see the, I, I, I want to see the balance." Maybe sheet. not. No, that's not. That hasn't you necessarily so? been traditionally the way it's been. The Democrats generally have been not in favor of corporate tax breaks and corporate supports like well, this. this. Republicans a, generally have been more in favor of these types well, of, uh, of you're things. You're right, in that case, yeah, right. right you know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, for, for it's, the corporate, it's, for the corporate it's world. It's a very right, complicated right. thing. Yeah. I mean, but you can look at it for things like food stamps and Medicare as well. I yeah. mean, you know, it, you, what, what are the benefits versus what we're, what we're losing? I mean, it's a really complicated question. I mean, I guess the, the idea is, how do we know? How do we know the truth of well, it? To me, to me, here's the biggest, uh, this is why I've been chuckling about this uh, uh, a little bit. Is, is you say, okay, well, we're going to give, we're going to support manufacturing in the United States, so we're going to give tax breaks or tax incentives, which comes from where? Tax the payers. taxpayer, right? Right, exactly. Right, right. So we're going to do that, but we're going to not, we're going to de defund it. We're going to de defund something like the MEP, right? So basically, all you're really doing is shifting taxpayers' dollars from here to here. Right. So then that raises the question, okay, well if all you're doing is shifting taxpayer dollars, we're going to take it away from, let's say, the MEP. We don't know if that's going to happen, but let's say it does. We're going to take taxpayer dollars away from the MEP and instead it's going to come from tax incentives for manufacturing companies. Mm -hmm. Which one has the most benefit? To me, the one that has the most benefit is not benefiting a particular company or even a, a group of companies. One is but what benefits manufacturing as a whole? And to me, that comes back to organizations, you know, like the, the MEP and- Manufacturing uh, USA. And, yeah, exactly. That are building uh, infrastructure. That are that building are, infrastructure. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's great to help an individual company, it's great for that company, but what it, does it do for manufacturing as a whole? So yeah. if, if, I'm, if I'm talking about the same amount of taxpayer money, if I'm, I'm talking about just shifting it from here to here, my personal feeling is, eh, probably makes more sense more here where yeah. it's more holistic, where it's really dealing with manufacturing as a whole and not just helping a particular company. That's that's good, Derek. You did very well. <laughs> not like that, that right? He was, he was on it, man. That's well, my argument, and I'm sticking to it. Next week, you get a chance to throw it back at me. <laughs> Trust I me, doubt I'm, I will do that I'm well. Going to but do that for you. Thanks, Derek. Right. That, then that's our off-script segment. Uh, yeah, we'll do that every week. That's fine. We like, yeah. we like doing that. And you know, hey, as a reminder, uh, email us at qdlqualitydigest.com if you have an off-script. I mean, um, how we'll would make we, up something. How would we do that? I guess one of us would read it sure. and throw it to the other one. So we, we're yeah. trying to be surprising about this. So <laughs> All right. Check that out. Well, that is it for today. Um, don't forget, next week, uh, if you're interested in uh, context of the organization mm -hmm. or interested in parties, you're going to watch the DECRA webinar, ISO Revisions, Context of the Organization, uh, next Thursday, February 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, the webinar is going to be presented by Pam Bethune, who you just saw, very uh, nice speaker, very clear and concise. Mm -hmm. um, keep an eye on your email uh, inbox for details about that, or if, uh, you can go to the link underneath the player page, click that, and you can go out and register for the webinar. So that is it for today, and we're going to see you next week. Have a great weekend. So long. Bye.